Hey, Florida Hosa, I'm Trisha Sekamori, your Northern VP Secondary, and today we have a surprise for you. I'm joined with a very special guest, Dr. Irfan Khan. So Irfan, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a fun fact about yourself. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, so I'm Irfan. Um, so I'm uh, currently an orthopedic surgery resident at LSU in New Orleans. Um, so I was born and raised in South Florida. Um, went to high school at Palm Beach Gardens, where I initially got um, involved with HOSA, um, then went to Nova Southeastern for undergrad, and then FIU for med school. Um, you know, really throughout undergrad, um, I was very blessed to have the opportunity to be a Florida HOSA state officer for two years. Um, and then during my senior year, served on the IEC, um, which was a really awesome experience. Um, a fun fact about myself is I have a twin sister who um, was also a state officer with me in Florida HOSA. So I uh, definitely, definitely loved, uh, loved doing that together with her. And, um, you know, HOSA has such a special place in my heart. I was part of it for, for seven years uh, as, a, as a member and then, um, you know, just continued to try to stay involved as an alumni. That's awesome. Were you guys serving on the board at the same time or was it different years? That's yeah, we were we were together. It was my second year. Um my second year as a state officer, we we served together. So yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so you kind of touched on this, but if you could just tell us a little bit about your HOSA journey in general, like what got you into HOSA and how you were able to balance like undergrad lifestyle and HOSA. Yeah, so um, so initially um, in high school, uh, I was in a pre-med program at Gardens, and um, I remember like HOSA was just kind of one of those things that like everyone did after school for fun. Um, you know, there was always like different events going on, and um, you know, they used to do like this um, like homecoming parades together, and so that's actually the first thing I ever did in HOSA. Like, um, we all put together like these signs and banners for our homecoming parade. Um, and then I was like, oh, wow, like this is like, it was just a lot of fun. And so um, during my junior year, that was the first year that I like got more involved and like started to do competitions and such. And so I started off um, doing like the sports medicine competition um, because a few people came up to me, they're like, hey, like, you know, you love sports, like, you know, you want to go into medicine in the future, like this sounds like it'd be fun for you. Um, so I was like, yeah, for sure. And like, I'm so happy that like those people like pushed me to do that because um, because through that, then I started um, like getting to compete locally and then going to states um, and then getting to like go to nationals. And so it was it was just so much fun, um, you know, and, and back then uh, there was only nationals. It was not international. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so so, you know, it's um, it, that's kind of how I initially got started. Um, and then, you know, as high school went on, uh, during senior year, I was like, Hey, like, you know, I'd love to get more involved in leadership. And so, um, I initially like got involved at my school and then, um, ran for regional office. And so, um, you know, it was, it was just and from there on, like, you know, just getting to work with like all of the incredible like faculty. And, you know, I, I think like working with all your advisors are amazing working with all your peers, like, you know, everyone's just excited for HOSA. And I felt like that just like kept me wanting, like it kept me wanting to do more. Um, and so then that kind of like motivated me to run for states. And then, um, you know, throughout states, I mean, there's so many good people throughout Florida HOSA that, you know, so many people to think that, you know, it's it's just one of those things where you do it and like you absolutely fall in love with it. And, um, and like through hosting like all the different events and, you know, like FLDA states and going to like different um, like regional conferences, um, you know, you really just fall in love with it. And um, and then that kind of motivated me to run for IAC. And so um, so the, the, and then, of course, like, you know, IAC um, and traditionally, I think like Florida HOSA has a really good like our experience just preps you really well for IEC. And so you get there and like, you know, you feel like ready to roll and like ready to like serve your role. And, um, and it was awesome. I mean, we had so much fun that year. It's it, like literally like half of the IEC, we were all like really good friends like beforehand. So it was cool to like, you know, you knew exactly who you're working with. And like, you know, we, we had a lot of fun doing it. So it was, it was awesome. It was a really good year. Yeah, no, I definitely get that. Um, I, I was a chapter officer and then a regional officer too. And I think kind of the environment and the ambiance of like 
meeting new people and like especially at state leadership conferences and stuff it's just such a blast so I completely get that um so you touched on an interest in sports medicine so did that kind of lead into what field you're pursuing and like if you could tell us about why you chose that when I went to undergrad, um, having done like the sports medicine competition. So I think like our competition is like really geared to athletic training as a profession. And so um, I got like, uh, through preparing for sports medicine, I got a lot of exposure to athletic training. And so then I majored in AT um, at Nova. And, um, and it was awesome, because like, you know, I always knew that like, hey, like I want to become a physician. And like, honestly, like even throughout medical school, I didn't know 100% know exactly what type, but I always knew I wanted, like I wanted to do something musculoskeletal just based on like having experience like in athletic training. Um, and, and it was honestly awesome because like, uh, like going to do AT, you learn a lot of like the musculoskeletal evaluation and um, you learn a lot of things that I think are like just super helpful for you as a physician in the future. Um, and so it kind of pushed so sports medicine pushed me to do AT and then AT pushed me want to want to do something in musculoskeletal medicine. Um, and then, you know, kind of like just based on like my experiences through everything, I was like, you know, like I really, I really like surgery. And so I just love being in the OR. Like I, I have a lot of love and respect for our non-operative like sports medicine colleagues. And, um, you know, I think it's, it, that itself had its own like gratitude, um, or like a, the gratifying part of it. But, um, I think at the end of the day, like you know, it's like, I love working with my hands and like just doing that every day. And so that's kind of what like pushed me to want to go and do orthopedic surgery. Um, and like, you know, kind of go on the surgical side of musculoskeletal medicine. So yeah, no, it definitely, it definitely played a big role though. And like, you know, it was, it was nice to kind of have like a little bit of that, like tunnel vision going throughout and knowing like, Hey, like, you know, I want to do like this type of like medicine and like just having to pick between a few things rather than like almost everything because medicine is just super broad. Yeah. So how long is your residency? Kind of like how rigorous is it? And if you could tell us a little bit about like your daily schedule or like what it looks like. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, so our program is five years long. Um, and so most people do like five years for residency and then they'll do a one-year fellowship after. Um, and so that's kind of like in its own subspecialty, like whatever you decide to do. So, um, you know, options for that are like sports medicine, pediatrics, like foot and ankle, joint replacement, um, spine, there's just, there's a bunch of options for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think in general, like, um, orthopedic residency is definitely um, it's it, they they work you pretty hard um, because you know in at the end of the day like you know you only have five years to learn and like feel comfortable and confident as a surgeon and like you know it's not natural like you know you can't point me to one person and say like oh it's natural for them to like cut skin open or it's natural for them to like you know put screws into someone's spine or it's natural for them to like you know, be really good at casting in like, so all those things just take a repetition and take time. And so, um, but again, it's like, you know, five years sounds like a lot, but honestly, as you're going through it, like I'm already four months in and like, I'm like, well, wow, time is flying so fast. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's definitely, a, it, it sounds long, but honestly, time flies so fast. And like, especially like most people who do orthopedics, like really enjoy it. So I feel like you don't notice like, yeah, like your days are going to be long, um, you know, it's like untypical, like when you're in an orthopedic rotation, like you're probably waking up at like four o'clock or so get to the hospital by like 4 30, um, you know, see all your patients in the morning, get everyone checked in, um, before, like for surgery that day, um, meet with everyone at 6 30 to like run the list. Like you're meeting with all your co-residents, all the attendings, um, and then like go like grab a quick snack before cases start at like seven, seven thirty. Um, and then you're just kind of operating throughout the day. And then, um, you know, if you're, I think most times, like if you're not on call, like you're probably going to be done by like four or five ish or so. Um, but then, uh, you know, it's like, if there's any floor work that needs to be handled, like, especially as an intern, like, you know, you want to kind of help out and help other people operate more. So like, you'll go take care of it. Um, so it's like your days could probably be from like four 30 to like, 
you know, five, six, seven. And then sometimes like if you're taking call, um, you'll be on overnight call after that. So like, um, like for us, uh, the way that our program kind of runs is that we'll do like once you finish with all your stuff for that day, then usually you start call at like 4 p.m. or so, um, at least on that rotation that I was on. Um, and then you're, t you're on the whole night. So it's like, if anyone, like, you know, if anyone comes in with the fracture with the dislocation, like, you know, the ED will give you a call or if patients on the floor, like need anything, like they're having issues with like pain or their medicate other medications, and they'll kind of give you a call about it. Um, and then you just, you know, you restart your day the next morning. So it's, um, it's, it's definitely like, you know, time consuming, rigorous, like, um, but at the end of the day, though, honestly, like, I think like if you asked all the orthopedic surgery residents around the country, I'd say like 90 to 95% of them, like wouldn't change it for a thing. So no, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely very rewarding. And, you know, even if you work long hours, it's totally worth it. That's so awesome. And is that something like that rigorous schedule of like 4am to like 7pm? Is that something that you kind of got used to, or is that just something you were kind of like thrown into and then you just had to figure it out along the way. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, like during your fourth year, you'll do away rotations a little bit that like are pretty long hours like that. So you at least know what you're getting into. Um, but honestly, it's one of those things where like, you know, when you have the responsibility on your shoulders of like having to like, you know, make medical decisions and stuff like it's that self just makes it feel like a totally different amount of time. Um, but honestly, you get used to it. Like, you know, honestly, like you, once you do it a few times, you're like, all right, cool. Like you'll get out like after a 12 hour shift, you're like, oh, Paul, like I'm done early. And you're like, <laughs> and most people are like, you're like, what? But like, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things where like you, you just get used to it. And I think it's like expectations with yourself and with people around you and say, Hey, like, you know, during the week, like you probably won't see me much just cause it's, it'll be busy, but um but yeah you know it's like it's nice because like you'll you'll get time on the weekends and stuff to like just recharge and uh and do what you want so it's it's nice for sure that's awesome um so kind of like how did you manage your time either through undergrad medical school <laughs> now like something that's you know you definitely have a rigorous schedule and stuff so how did you go about managing your time Yeah. So honestly, one thing um, is like just efficiency and like, it's something that I think with time you just get better at, um, you know, and, and like, as you get more comfortable at each stage, you just get better at it. Like, um, you know, I remember like in high school, right. It's like, you'll be participating in these different organizations or clubs and, you know, you'll play these sports and then like you have this homework to do and um, you know, preparing for these tests and like eventually like, you know, once you do it for long enough, right, I think you get a little comfortable and like you just build your routine. Um, same thing in undergrad, right? It's like you're participating in these or certain organizations, like, you know, you have to study for your um, classes and stuff. And um, I think at each stage, literally like, you know, medical school, residency, like you just figure out like, okay, like what can I do to just be more efficient and just give myself more time? Right. Because that's the only way that you like you'll you can spend the whole day doing stuff. And like it's great, like if you're initially learning stuff and whatnot, but like you just find as you get more comfortable with things that like things go quicker. Right. It's like initially maybe it'll take you like, you know, 10 minutes to get a history from a patient. But then by the time you get really good at it and like cut it down, like that time gets cut down a bit. And like, you know, just things like that where like if you're being efficient throughout the day, then you give yourself more time at the end. Um, and that's at every stage, right? Like you'll, you get more efficient and more comfortable with managing your time. And like, because of that, you give yourself more time to like do what you want eventually. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so what were your most and least favorite parts of medical school, like going through the whole process? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so honestly, so my first, so I would say that my first year, um, transitioning was not fun. Like the transition to med school was, um, was actually like, I don't know, some people I think do really well with it. Um, and like, you know, some people, uh, are like troopers, they hit the, they hit the gates running and like, 
you know, they do really well early on. But I feel like for me, like it was the polar opposite. Like I got to medical school and that first class, like really like it, it was tough for me. Like I remember I literally failed the first test and then like I had to, and that class only has two tests. And so like, you're like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know if I'm going to pass my first class. And so like, it was, it was really stressful. Um, and like, it was, it was definitely a tough transition for me. Um, but yeah, I would say like I, my least favorite part was probably the transition um, that, and then I think like during your third and fourth year, um, it's, it's amazing. Like I would take third and fourth year in a heartbeat compared to first and second year, but like, there is this element then of like, um, like not having control over your schedule. It's like, whenever people will tell you to come to the hospital, like that's when you have to go. Right. And like versus first and second year, um, like, I think the good part about medical school, honestly, is that like, you have a lot of flexibility with your time right? Like most classes aren't mandatory. And so it's like, if you want to sit at home and watch your, watch, watch the lectures or use other resources to cover that material, like you totally can. Um, and so it's nice, like, you know, I think you get to spend more time with like other people, spend more time with your family, friends. Um, so I thought that was a nice part about it, actually, as like rigorous as the first year is and like first two years are. I felt like once you get used to it, like, you know, it, it gets much better. Um, but yeah, I would say like, that's, that was probably my favorite part. Um, just like at least like for first two years, but honestly, like nothing beats third and fourth year when you're like finally in the hospital and like, you see like kind of the fruits of your labor panning out where it's like, you know, stuff like you, like you, you know, like, Oh, oh like, wow. Like that patient has X, Y, Z. And, um, you know, you get to like kind of work with patients and like learn how to like figure out, develop plans for them and, um, you know, help them understand what's kind of going on with their, with their body. And so, um, you know, I, I thought that part was like super rewarding because like you work so hard in like high school, undergrad and like med the first few years of med school to like finally see it start paying off, like where people are like, Oh, Hey, like you're a future doctor. Like, what's going on with me and like you know you're kind of able to like sit down and talk people through it I think that's like that was more than worth it um for sure so I don't know it's 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 ups and downs as is everything else like you know undergrad same deal there's ups and downs high school there's ups and downs so no, it's definitely uh it's definitely a roller coaster for sure so as you mentioned that transition what like what was the biggest difference between undergrad and medical school like was it that time commitment and that flexibility or like the rigor or like yeah honestly so people we had this analogy and like it's it i think it's true at every stage um like especially like when you transition to med school and then when you transition to residency a little bit um but like you're drinking out of a fire hose and like, that's literally what people say. Like people always say that when you transition to med school, they're like, you know, in undergrad, like the amount of content that you have to cover, like it's definitely manageable um, if you're not taking like 30 credits, right? Like if you're taking like a full-time load and like, you know, maybe one or like an extra class or something, like it's still very manageable, I think. Um, but like essentially for us, like when you're in, um, like for the first year of med school, um, one day of lecture is equivalent to one week's worth of undergrad material. So like, yeah, no, it's, it's honestly like it, the amount that you cover in a day in four hours is unbelievable. Like they're flying through slides and like, you're sitting there at the end of the day, you're like, I have like 200 slides to memorize from today. And like, it's, it's just kind of one of those things that like, when you initially start, you're like, how does anyone do this? But like, but then you realize that honestly, like anyone can do it. You just have to sit down and like put in the time with it and like get used to doing that. Um, you know, it's, it's not a matter of like, you know, people being smart or not. Like it really isn't like, it's just like about like, are you willing to work hard and like, you know, sit down at the material and do it. But yeah, it's like you're, you're drinking out of a fire hose for a little bit until you get used to it. <laughs> wow, that's that's a that's a fun analogy to use. Yeah. Uh, do you was Hosa worth it in the long run? Like, how do you think Hosa helped you either getting through the rigorous process or communication or like what ways did Hosa specifically help you? <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, a thousand times. Yes. And, uh, you know, honestly, like when I look back at everything, um, you know, Hoso is definitely like my favorite part of it all. Um, just cause like, you know, it, it, it kind of, um, it, it does a few things. One, um, you know, I think Hosa just makes you really passionate about healthcare and about, um, you know, about like leadership and, um, you know, it, it trains you to, to become a good leader and to become someone who like has the right values and ideas in mind. Um, and like, those are so invaluable, I think for your career, because, um, especially like, any healthcare field, right? You're working as part of a team. And so having good leadership skills and um, being able to like work well with people and like just having passion for what you do, like it automatically makes the team so much better. Um, and so I think in those ways, like, you know, like HOSA really is invaluable and um, and you build like lifelong friends. I mean, um, like I've, I had like a lot of like my HOSA, like family at my wedding and, you know, it's like just you, like I'll catch up with people in HOSA like all the time. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where like, you just truly build like a lifelong relationship with all those people, like, you know, your advisors and state advisors and all your, your like co, um, like co, uh, um, like co-leadership people, like, you know, everyone who's on your state team, everyone's on your IAC team, like um, all the members that you work with, like, you know, it's crazy to me because like, I remember even like this past year, like I was looking at like the state officer team. I'm like, wow, like I remember when these people started in middle school, like, ser like you know, it's kind of the last wave of like people who I like remember from my time in HOSA it made me feel old, but like, um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where like, it's so rewarding to see like people going throughout their journey. Um, and so it, it was, it was so rewarding. Like if I could put one word on it, honestly, it was, it was rewarding. Like, um, and, and I would do it, do it over again. And like, I think the one nice thing too, is like when you're so caught up in like studying for like undergrad and like studying for all these things and like taking care of those like it was always a nice like retreat to just like hey like let's go to this meeting or hey let's go to like WLA let's go to SLC and like you know just like get your like have your opportunity to like kind of like be reminded of why you're working so hard and like doing what you're doing um so that was always really nice too like it just kind of like kept kept me grounded throughout the whole experience so yeah no it's it was um it was it was an amazing time like I I really wouldn't trade it for anything and um, you know, especially nowadays with like most places having like middle school hostess and stuff like, you know, I think those people are just even luckier to like have more time to be able to be in HOSA because, you know, it's it, it changed my life for sure. And I'm sure it does the same for many other people. So, yeah, that's a good way to think about it, because like for WLA and stuff, we were getting like four or five hours of sleep and we were like tired <laughs> getting through it. But I, it's a nice kind of mindset to think about it like a little vacation or like an exciting thing to do um so since you have a background in HOSA and have obviously held high offices do you have any advice for anyone interested in running for HOSA offices or like kind of getting over that fear of like what if I don't get it yeah no absolutely I I think anyone who's like starting off um like has that fear without a doubt Right. I remember even like for me, like even running for your own school's board, like your local um, like chapter officer position, like, you know, it's intimidating because you're like, oh, wow, like, you know, I'm here with my peers and like, you know, I like I hope that I do well and like I wonder what they think of me. I hope I don't embarrass myself with like my speech and all that stuff. Right. Um, so it's it's definitely like at every level of it, there's always kind of going to be that like hey, like, um, you know, you don't want to like look bad and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, right, like if like the biggest thing is that if you um, like if you don't try, you'll never know. And so it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like the worst. I remember one of, one of my mentors um, always said, like, uh, the, like, if you don't ask, the answer will always be no. And so it's like if you like, you know, if you don't ask, like, hey, like, you know, should, can I do this? Like, should I just go for it? Right. Like if you don't try it, you'll, you'll never become an officer. Right. And so like, at the end of the day, like, um, I think everyone should try. I think it's honestly an awesome opportunity. 
Um, you know, I was super intimidated at literally every single level, um, chapter officer. I remember a regional officer position, like, um, I like ran against an incumbent actually, which I was like, oh, wow, this is so scary. Um, and like, even at the state level, like, you know, um, trying to think at the state level, actually my first year I lost, um, I lost to, to Jay, Jay Tellis, um, who ended up being our like president elect and president for HOSTA. Um, and so like, I mean, me and Jay were literally like amazing friends, um, afterwards and, you know, it's, it just teaches you important lessons, right? Like you're not always going to win, um, you know, and, and it sucks. It's a gut punch, right? It, it, you feel bad. Other people make you feel bad. Um, like, oh, wow. Like, why'd you lose? And all that type of stuff. But then at the day, like, you know, it, it's one of those things where like it just teaches you some resilience and like the worst thing that can happen is you lose and you just try again the next year right like and and that's exactly what i did and like you know next two years got elected and then um even at the international level like i literally ran against one of my best friends in hosa and it was heartbreaking for both of us because we were like we we're just sad that we got slated against each other um and so it's it's one of those things where like, you know, if you don't try, the answer will always be no. So I think you should always give it a shot because um, you never know. Like, you'll surprise yourself with what you're ca like capable of achieving for sure with all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, So kind of like an ortho specific question, just to switch gears. Um, One of our members was asking, what's the best way to help athletes learn about injury prevention in sports? Yeah, you know, so um, when it comes to injury prevention, um, there's a lot of, it, it is actually really interesting. We were just talking about this, like in a program the other day. Um, so first and foremost, um, you know, especially people who are in like middle school, high school, um, and even undergrad, um, participating in multiple sports is probably one of the best ways to um, help prevent injuries because um, you're working different muscle groups right? You're giving your body the chance to, to heal from like, you know, a full season. Like, for example, like, let's say you do, um, let's say you do like football in the fall and then do like track in the spring, right. Or like soccer in the spring. And so they're both, um, you know, they're similar in certain ways, but like, you're going to be using different muscle groups and such like for each of the sports. And so, um, when it comes to injury prevention, honestly, like being a multi-sport athlete, is actually one of the best ways to help prevent injuries because you just let your body relax and um you know you're working different muscle groups and like it it's definitely very very beneficial for you overall as an athlete because each every sport teaches you different skills and like if you're able to bundle all those things together then um typically participating in multiple sports also makes you a better athlete like i think if you look at all of the former like NFL number one picks, they've all been like multi-sport athletes, right? It's like, if you specialize like only in baseball, only in travel soccer, only in basketball, like your chances of making it big are actually much lower. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. Um, but then too, like, and, and it's actually something that like I've been wanting to work on, um, but like, I just, I, I just need to build a good template for it and like actually do it. But I think like there's such a great opportunity nowadays with um, like using these like platforms like TikTok and like Instagram reels and just making quick little videos on like, hey, like, you know, these are certain injuries, like these are why they happen. This is how you can try to kind of prevent it from happening. Um, and then this is kind of like your expected recovery if it does happen. Um, and so like, you know, just finding like a reliable source on there. Um, I think would be pretty cool um, just to like help learn about different injuries and like how to prevent them. Um, but, you know, as, as cliche as it is, like, you know, one of the biggest things for like injury prevention is like sleep well, right. Which is hard to do, but like, it's a sacrifice, right? Like sometimes you just have to like turn off the video game console at 9 PM, like I'm going to sleep today. Um, or like, you know, try to finish your homework a little faster. Um, that like, um, you know, definitely like staying hydrated and eating well, right? I remember um, one of my preceptors and I need to take her advice more because like um, she used to say like, she's like, Irfan, if you're a Lamborghini, are you going to put regular gas in there, right? 
Like she's like, do you expect a Lamborghini to go just as fast with just regular gas, right? Or do you need to put like, you know, premium gas in there and make sure that's the right fuel for it, right? She's like, if you eat like garbage, guess what? You're not going to perform like a Lamborghini. You're going to perform like a Honda Civic, right? So like, I always thought it was so funny, but like, it's so true. Like what you put into your body is what you get out of it. Um, So like trying to optimize performance in that way as well. Um, and then like, you know, finally, I think if you get injured and like notice like things lingering, like, Hey, like this one thing feels sore. Like, you know, even like, like if your quadriceps feel sore, like, you know, make sure you're stretching it, make sure you're doing, um, exercises to help strengthen it and like prevent that from that soreness from becoming an injury, um, I think is also like super important, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging, like in, inherently the nature of playing sports, you're going to get hurt at some point. Um, but you just hope that like, you know, you try to do your best to prevent it for sure. And kind of our last question is what is your favorite book and what is your all time favorite movie? Okay, sweet. So, um, so my favorite book, um, so I'd say favorite book is The Last Lecture. Um, so I'm not sure. Have you ever read that book before? Um, so yeah, so it was by a professor at, um, at Carnegie Mellon. And so essentially, like, he um, he was diagnosed with cancer and only had, like, a very short amount of time to live. Um, but he had uh, kids that were really young. And so, like, they weren't going to remember him and who he was. And so, like, at Carnegie Mellon, they do this, um, they have this, like, uh kind of just like tradition where once you're retiring as a professor you give like your last lecture I mean it's just kind of like lessons you've learned throughout your career and like anything you want it to be um and so like he um so he ended up doing uh like a last lecture there and like you know like before he passed away and uh it was it was um it was just about like a lot of different life lessons um because like he was like you know since I won't be in your life um to like help guide you through it like I want to, you know, give this lecture to like help guide you through it. And it was, it was just a really powerful book. Like, you know, it's, it's a, just like even talking about it, like, man, like it's so sad. Like it sounds like really sad. And it, and it was like, you're like reading and you're like, wow, man, like this is terrible. Um, but it was, it was so good. Like such a good book. Like I think just a lot of really good quotes throughout it too. Um, and it's one of those things that like, just like, um I think like regardless of what age you are like you know you benefit from it a lot so um so I like that a lot um and for movies hmm, that one's actually hard I so it's funny I'm actually not a huge movie person um yeah I know it's funny my wife on the opposite is like a huge movie person so like um so I don't know let's see favorite movie um because honestly like I it's funny and it's gonna be like a terrible movie everyone's gonna be like why um but like I've always liked the Fast and Furious series I don't know why like for me just like growing up like that was always like the movie series that we would watch um and so it's like if I ever get excited about movies like there probably has something to do with cars or like the army or like some like type of war movie um but yeah so I've always liked the Fast and Furious series like I feel like it just has a lot of like um you know for me like it was always like kind of like talking about family and talking about like staying together and um I don't know I felt like those things were always like just really like really meaningful um and even though it's just a racing movie like you know I think at the end of the day like there are a lot of really cool things to like learn from it um yeah I'd I probably go with Fast and Furious <laughs> That's actually crazy. That's one of my favorite like series of movies. And I feel like it's so overhated for no reason. Like it's really not that bad. Yeah, no, exactly. I know. I think it's, I think it's amazing, but yeah, no, it's okay. You can, you can let the haters hate, right? We'll, we'll, we'll enjoy our fast and furious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for your time, Irfan. Um, definitely after speaking to like Jackie and Lloyd, you were the first person that they recommended because of how involved you still are and everything. And you're definitely like a huge inspiration to all of us. So thank you so much for all that you do. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Thank you so much. Um, You know, I'm definitely, definitely super excited to see everything you guys do and definitely hoping to try to try to come to the States this year. So yes. yeah, definitely, definitely look forward to meeting you guys soon. Yeah. Thank you so much.
All right, thank you.